So, here we are in week two of uh, Haggai, and the time is now. If you missed last week, then we went all the way back to King Solomon, who built the most uh, magnificent temple for God. People came from all over the known world at that point to uh, worship God and to give him honor, and to be honest, probably just to see the temple. It was uh, an amazing building. Unfortunately, we know that uh, in his life, and certainly after he died, uh, the people uh, of Israel turned away from God, and they began to build their own idols and worship other gods. And so God allowed a series of uh, events and incidents to take place to try and bring their focus back to him, to draw them back to himself. We talked last week about the destruction of the temple in 587 uh, BC under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the Babylonian army destroyed, in fact, completely devastated Judah, including the real insult of destroying the temple. The Babylonians took the Jewish people into uh, captivity, and they were in captivity for 70 years or thereabouts. You can imagine perhaps some sense of relief when after about 50 years or so, a remnant of people were allowed to go back into the land to begin to rebuild. Under the governor Zerubbabel, about 50,000 or so went back to rebuild the city. The first priority they were given was to rebuild the temple, the house of God, and so that's where they started. They got the foundations in place, they got the uh, altar in place, and then they met with some resistance. And, well, they just stopped. They gave up. Fourteen years, nothing happened. They just stopped. So God called Haggai to tell the people to get back to the task of rebuilding the temple. Chapter 1, verse 13 He's called them back, and it says there, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. That's one of the most important things uh, for any of us to know, that promise that God is with us. That's the important bit of uh, this story, but actually of every story, that God has promised to be with his people in whatever circumstance they face. And then in verse 14, it goes on to say, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty. Now, I don't know, but I would imagine that there is a time in the life of every believer when God stirs up your spirit. At least there should be. You know, we sh there, are, there are times when God calls us to do things, and he's, He gives us this passion and this desire, and our hearts, He stirs up our spirit for something. He gives us faith, and He gives us gifts in order to do what He's called us to do. God gives you hope of accomplishing something that he puts in your mind and on your heart. And that's what God did for the people of Israel. He gave them a sense of faith. It's like, we're supposed to rebuild the temple. Yes, let's go. He stirred up their spirits. And that happens to those of us who follow Jesus. There will be times, perhaps like that, perhaps out of the blue, when you just think, I've got to do this. I am supposed to do this thing for God. You have faith for something, and you want to attack it. You want to go for it, and that's because God has stirred up your spirit. However, for the Israelites, the story is a bit like this. They get all fired up, and then they start, and a month later, it's all fizzled out. They look at what they've done, and they're kind of like, is that it? Is that all there is? Is that it? That's pathetic. We really haven't done very much. And all of a sudden, everybody is really discouraged. If we're honest, we have to ask, how often does that happen in our lives? You know, we start off with real enthusiasm. Yes, let's do this. Come on. Oh! And then very quickly, it's kind of forgotten, and we might even have moved on to the next thing. I I'm kind of like that. I do know. 
And um, that kind of sums me up sometimes. I got all excited. And then it kind of disappears. It's kind of, you know, we've got our own temple that we can attack. We can really go, yes, we can build the temple. Oh, come on, let's go. One month later to the day. We know that because they gave us the dates. You know, obviously, it's quite important. It wasn't a very long time that they lasted with their enthusiasm. One month later, they're done. Now, I don't know what it is maybe for you. Maybe you just think, oh, yeah, we're going to get out of debt. We're going to get out of debt. Yes. It's like, ooh, Christmas. Ooh, starting January. Or maybe it's, I'm going to lose weight. Definitely. Definitely going to do it this time. Ooh, custard donuts. Next week. But you start, oh, yeah, and then all of a sudden, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and we don't make the progress that we want or think we should have, and we end up becoming discouraged. Well, that's exactly what happened to the people of God. It's like, well, yeah, we're going to do this for God, yeah. It's going to be amazing. And one month in, it hadn't done, uh, they hadn't gone as far as they had hoped to get, and they're discouraged. So God had Haggai ask them a question. And to me, it's a really loving question. It's almost as if God is trying to get them to think about the root of their discouragement. And so if you're discouraged today, perhaps it's for one of these two reasons that we find revealed in this question. Haggai chapter 2 verse 3, he asks them on behalf of God, who is left of you who saw that this house in its former glory? In other words, who's old enough to remember Solomon's temple? Wasn't that amazing? It was beautiful. It was brilliant. It was huge. It was fantastic. And, and God was there. And they look at their work and he says, how does it look to you now? Does it seem to you like nothing? Who of you remembers the former temple and all its glory? And this one to you looks like nothing. There are two causes of discouragement I want to talk about today. The first one is comparisons. Comparison. And the second is lack of progress. Comparisons and lack of progress. I think these people are doing the same kind of thing that we often do. They were comparing their start with someone else's finish. You see, if you look at the temple when it's finished and you see all the gold walls inside and you see it complete, it's a beautiful and amazing thing. But what they'd forgotten is it took years to get there and in fact, David had wanted to start it before Solomon and wasn't allowed to. It had taken a really long time to get to the end and they're looking at their pile of stones and they're trying to compare the two and you can't do that. It's not a true and proper comparison. Like we just started, our temple doesn't look very good compared to the last one. But they forget the last one was finished. Bible scholars estimate that Haggai was probably you know, around 70, 75 um, when he is prophesying and, and uh, this book is written. So if he's around 70, 75, 50 years ago, he'd have been 20 to 25, he would have remembered the temple. He would have been able to look back and make a comparison between the two. I don't know about you, but I sometimes get discouraged when I compare where other people are, and I'm not. Jobs, cars, houses, children, qualifications, new members, all things that we compare, and loads of others that we compare against other people. And sometimes when you do that, you get discouraged. You think, what's wrong with me? Why have I not? How did they get? What? You compared, just like the Israelites did. Our little pathetic attempt to build the new temple pales in comparison to the glory of Solomon's temple. We failed. And we're discouraged. Then also there's a lack of progress. That's what they did. We're a month into it, and it's not going very well. We're trying really hard, but we're getting nowhere, and it looks awful. And sometimes that's how we feel. You say, 
going on the diet, going to get in shape, going on a diet for a whole month, you eat nothing but kale and almonds, and you gain two pounds. It's like, what? I tried really hard. I've eaten kale and almonds, for goodness sake. You take two steps forward, and it seems like three steps backward. Maybe for some of you, it's your whole lack of spiritual progress. You think, I've been a Christian for all this time, and yet I still say things that I shouldn't, and I still do things that I shouldn't. We're coming to worship God. We're going to church today, and we argued all the way here because we were late. For some of you, it's your children, maybe even adult children. You've given them good advice. You're doing everything you can to help them make good decisions. And you're like, could you be any more stupid? You know, you've got the experience, the knowledge, the background, and you're looking at them and you see the decisions they're making are destructive and you're trying to help them. Particularly teenagers, nobody listens because they know all the answers themselves. And you're like, ah! Right? And it's really frustrating and disheartening. Maybe spiritually, you're trying really hard to overcome that one sin. And you look back and you're thinking, I've been walking with Jesus all this time and that one sin, maybe I'm never going to be able to overcome that. Maybe it's just not worth it. You wake up one day and you think, I've tried, I've done my best. And you're discouraged. I'm going to take a risk. And I'm going to be honest. I'm not looking for sympathy. But I have noticed recently that lots of ministers that I'm in contact with are really struggling with discouragement. An increasing number of comments and conversations on social media and personally. Struggling and wondering about how difficult ministry has become and how impossible it is to meet all of the expectations that people have. I think it's a real and genuine spiritual attack on leaders of the church because of the numbers of people who are affected by it. And I have to say, recently it affected me too. I, I don't want compliments. I'm not doing it for that. I just want to be honest with you. you know, I'm discouraged by my sinfulness. I'm a follower of Jesus and a minister and I'm ashamed of some of the things that I do. I'm conscious of my failures and I often feel that I'm not doing a good job. When I go home today, I'll go over the service in my head and think about the things that I wish I had said or that I wish I hadn't said. I feel a sense of divine responsibility for you. Jesus is the good shepherd and we are his sheep, I know that. But the other metaphor is that under Jesus, I am the shepherd. And it's my responsibility to help the sheep follow Jesus. And sometimes I just feel rubbish at it. Now, you might be wondering why on earth I would tell you that. And it's quite simple. I want to say that we are all in it together. It's very easy to stand here at the front and to put up a front and somehow to suggest that ministers are not in any way affected by things that affect everybody else. And that is not the truth. The truth is we are all in it together. We all go through periods of discouragement and disappointment. I, I'm not really complaining. I, most of the time, I love what I do. I really do. So what do we do when we face times of discouragement? Well, what God tells his people to do when they're discouraged. You know, they're there and they're saying, we're building the temple and it's just not going very well. It's never going to be as good as Solomon's temple. We're trying to do the best we can and the best just isn't good enough. God gives them the most simple, straightforward, loving instructions. And to me, that's one of the great things about this wee book. It reminds us how loving God is. If you remember last week, they're like, we don't know how to build a temple. And God says, well, let me just make it easy for you. If you missed last week, it's online. Go and watch it. It was quite good. God said to them, it's just one, two, three. Here's what to do. Number one, go up the mountain. Number two, bring down the wood. And number three, build the temple. Do you know, when you don't know what to do, break it down into nice, easy, manageable steps. Go up the mountain, bring the wood, build the temple. 
said then it's about choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. You've got to choose. You've got to make that choice when it comes to it. Haggai 2.4 says this. And if you read the book, you'll see this refrain again and again. Starts with Zerubbabel, then Joshua, then the people. Now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. Be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Joshua, be strong, all you people, and work. Why? Because I am with you. What do you do when you're discouraged? God essentially says two things. The first thing he says is this, be strong. And then he says, do the work. If you're discouraged right now, what have you to do? God says, be strong and do the work. When you're discouraged and you want to give up, what does God say? Be strong and do the work. The great news is that we don't have to be strong in our own power. In fact, that is never going to work. I've been there, I've tried it, it doesn't work. We live, however, in New Testament times, and our New Testament teaches us that when we are weak, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. In other words, I don't have to be strong in my own strength because we know it doesn't work, but I have a supernatural strength living in me. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me and in anyone who believes. In fact, when you can't do any more and you're about to give up, that's when you're the perfect candidate for God's strength to work through you. So be strong in the Lord and do the work. Notice he didn't say, talk the talk, but do the work. He didn't say, dream the dream, but do the work. He didn't say, compare the results, but do the work. What do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong in his power and you do the work. As it were, you would put down another stone for the temple. Maybe you think, oh, well, I just put down a stone. It didn't make a lot of difference. So what do you do? You put down another stone and another stone and another stone. You think, oh, but it's not really working but you have to be consistent. And the thing that God has called you to do that's going to take you closer to him, you have to be consistent and you have to do it and do it and do it and do it until you can move on. You put down another stone and another stone and another stone. You consistently do the hard thing. It would be easy to go home. It would be easy to say there's not a lot of progress, but God says be strong and do the work. Be strong and keep doing this. Be strong in the Lord and put down another stone and another one and another one. And when you want to give up, what do you do? You be strong and you do the work, even when you don't see results. You continue to be open to God's word and to seek him daily in his word. You be strong and you continue to do the right thing even when you're not getting anywhere or it seems that way. You be strong and you continue to pay off your debt even if it's only a few pounds a month. You take a step in the right direction and you do it month after month after month laying down stones. You continue to do the right thing. You be strong and you continue to love when other people are not loving in return. You be strong and you bring your best when everybody else is just making do. You be strong and you show honor even when the person over you is not acting honorably. You be strong and you continue to love your spouse even when your spouse is unresponsive. You be strong and you continue to reach out to that person even when they don't hear you or let you in. You be strong and you continue to love your children and pray for your children and stand for your children even when they don't stand for anything that you believe is right. When I find myself discouraged, I continue to say, in the strength of God, I will be strong and I will show up and I will do the work every single week. Here's what I'll do. I'll continue to pray. I'll continue to seek God on your behalf and for myself. I'll continue to study his word. I'll continue to lead with every fiber in my body and I will preach Christ crucified, risen, and here to transform lives. And together we will continue to do it stone after stone after stone. Even although sometimes we don't see things happening. 
And it might be that even now somebody here is comparing, well, I'm not really there yet. I wish I was, but I'm not, and I'm discouraged. I don't see the progress. You have to decide to trust in God's strength when you have none of your own. The promise is, I am with you. And it's still true today. It's still true for you. Be strong in the Lord and do the work. That's why God's word is so powerful. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 9 says this, let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If I had ended the message right now, basically it would have been a, yeah, go on, you can do it, just pull your socks up. That's not really what it's about. It's not a bad message but it's incomplete. God says, be strong and do the work, for I am with you. That's the important bit, the most important bit. I am with you, declares the Lord, and that's the key to all of it. It's not that you do it on your own, it's that you do it with him. What God was going to show them is the most world-changing news since the beginning of time, and they didn't understand it. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty, and in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Can you just imagine? They're looking at this pile of rubble, and God says to them, the, the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the other house. And they're looking going, Ah, you're right. It's, it's a pile of stones. And they don't see it. Even secular historians would tell you that Zerubbabel's temple wasn't even close to Solomon's temple. It just wasn't going to happen. There was no way. But they had no idea that God was actually foreshadowing a New Testament truth, and that was his love. You see, all through the Old Testament, what happens in the physical is often a, a picture of what happens in the spiritual in the New Testament. It's a foreshadowing. God shows physically what he's going to do spiritually. He shows naturally what he's going to do supernaturally in the future. In the Old Testament, people had to go to the temple and make a sacrifice in the hope of getting right with God. But the New Testament says, if you are a follower of my son, I actually live within you. You don't have to go to the temple anymore and there is no more sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they had to go. For us now, God has come. It won't be that long till we get to Advent and Christmas and we think of Emmanuel, God with us. He has come. He is the sacrifice so that we can be right. And that changes everything. We don't have to be strong in our own strength and do the work on our own. We do it because he is with us more importantly, as believers, he is in us. And his word says that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. You see, the truth is Jesus is the greater glory. And when he was revealed, that glory was also revealed. And one day when he comes back, that prophecy from Haggai will be fulfilled because we will see him in all his glory and we will stand in awe. Every time you put a stone down in his name, you are glorifying him. When you serve someone, he is being glorified. When you love someone, he is being glorified. When you forgive someone, he is being glorified. When you lift up his name, he is being glorified. And here's why we should not be discouraged. We are not alone. We are not alone as believers. We don't have to go to a temple and to make a sacrifice in the hope of finding God because he dwells in us, his people. He is the greater glory. And that's why we don't need to be discouraged. And it's why if we find ourselves being discouraged, we know we have a way to deal with it. 
we are not alone. He is with us. That is his promise. He says, be strong and do the work because I am with you. Therefore, we know that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to carry it out to the end. So let's not become weary in doing good because at the proper time, there will be a harvest if we don't give up. So if today you are discouraged, remember that God came to you. He made the sacrifice so that you could be right with him. And he's not only just with you, he's in you. And with him, nothing is impossible. Amen.